good evening. If you got your Bible, I'm in the book of Psalm. Uh, I'm looking at a Psalm chapter 24. Psalm 24. This was the message that I brought to the nursing home. I'm making this on an early Tuesday morning. Uh, I'm talking about late in the night, so it's only probably, I don't know, around 1.30 in the morning when I'm making this on Tuesday morning. It'll post uh, uh, Tuesday evening, Lord willing, if everything works. But I believe the Lord showed me this. I was praying the other night, and I asked him, I said, Lord, I need your word for the people. And, you know, I'm just going to be straight up. You don't have to do a whole lot of study to talk to someone that is very weak in their body. They're very elderly you half wonder if they all are paying attention and you feel like in a way you're just sort of talking to yourself. But I've got enough sense to realize that the Bible says not one word will come back to him void. Whether anyone listens to the message or anyone doesn't listen, it doesn't come back to God void. Um, again, Psalm 24, we're just going to start with the first verse. There's only 10 verses here. I'm going to try to do it exactly the way that I did it in the nursing home. Will it come out the exact same way? Probably not. But this is what I delivered to the folks t today. It says in verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Lord made everything. Take a person that is lost. The Lord made the person that is lost. Take a person that doesn't know Jesus Christ in salvation. That's a lost person. It says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything that fills up the earth is the Lord's. That doesn't mean that everybody knows the Lord in salvation. It just means that God has made everything from the foundation of the earth when the earth got started. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Talking about the men and women, boys and girls, that are dwelling in the world, the world as we know it is the planet Earth. It says here, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas. Well, if I remember when Genesis 1-1 was written, in the beginning, God. And I believe that he made the oceans and then he made the dry land and he divided the land between the, the water and the oceans and the dry land. He says here, for he hath founded it upon the seas, talking about the earth, talking about the ground part of the earth. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Talking about the water in the ocean, he allowed the the ground to come out from a, a below the, the sea surface, and he allowed it to come through. He either allowed the water to go down, or he allowed the earth to come through it. But God is the one that made it all. It says that he made it all. Who shall ascend? into the heel of the Lord. Now, it didn't say descend, it said ascend. Who shall ascend into the heel of the Lord? Now, where's the heel of the Lord at? I believe that's where the Lord is today. 
we can go to the heel of the Lord today, but where is this verse here referring to? I believe it's referring to the place where Jesus is today. I can live in the heel of the Lord today, but is he talking about living inside me? Or is he talking about the place of the heel of the Lord? Who shall ascend into the heel of the Lord? Who's going to be the believer? God knows who the believer is already. But who's going to ascend into the hill of the Lord? And then he clarifies the question here. Or who shall stand in his holy place? Who's going to stand in the place of the holy place? The person that is saved. The person that is born again. The person that realizes that they are the Lord's in the fullness thereof, just like it said in verse number one. But then he, that question is, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? That's the first question. The second question, or who shall stand in his holy place? That's the place of the Lord right here where it says that you will ascend into the hill of the Lord. It's a holy place. But listen who actually goes to this holy place, who ascends to this holy place. You see the answer in verse, chapter, verse number four. He that hath clean hands. I remember a lot of times enjoying watching Judge Judy. And Judge Judy would always remind the people that, look, you can't come in here with dirty hands. If your hands are dirty, then you're just as guilty as the guilty party. What is he saying right here? He that hath clean hands. It's not talking about the clean hands of my hands. It's talking about the clean hands of living honestly before God. Talking about an honest relationship before God. Being who the Lord wants you to be before God. He says, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. You know what the word pure means? One substance. One substance. You know, you take milk out of a cow. The milk is one substance when it comes out of the cow. It's pure milk. It ain't added with anything or taking away anything. It comes from the tit all the way out. And milk is milk. It's a pureness of milk. It says here, Who he that has clean hands and a pure heart. A heart that is one substance. What is that substance? The Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity? You know what vanity is? Emptiness before God. Meaning somebody that is empty when they stand before the Lord. They're empty. They have nothing to show for their life. They have nothing to show for their self. When they have full of vanity. Remember the writer in Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes says, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Everything earthly is vanity. We're all going to leave it behind. I'm going to leave everything I have behind. If I die tonight, I'm going to leave everything I've got behind. I'm not taking nothing with me. Not nothing. Do I need anything to take anything with me? No, absolutely not. And hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. You got deceit in you? Could it be robbing you of the joy of your salvation? That's what, that's what deceit does. Deceit can't take away your salvation, but it can sure enough rob it. I'm not talking about robbing it far as stealing from you. 
it can somebody can rob me. That doesn't mean they got to rob everything that I own. What does he say right here in this verse? Who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. That's the ones that has clean hands and a pure heart. But listen to verse number five. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Talking about the ones that's got clean hands and a pure heart now. The ones that don't have vanity. The ones that ain't swearing deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The very person that God was saying up there in that verse where it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Not everybody is full of the Lord. A lot of people's full of their self. They're not full in the Lord. They don't have salvation. It mentions salvation in verse number five right here. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Talking about the pure in heart now. The ones that's got clean hands. The ones that's going to stand in the holy place. The one who's going to ascend to the hill of the Lord. And then he goes on to say, This is the generation of them that seek him. That seek thy face, O Jacob. Now we read the Bible. We're talking about history in that one particular verse. But he's talking about a generation. Could he be talking about our generation as well? Sure. This ain't just for Jacob back in the day of Jacob. This is for everybody. I want to think it affects everybody for the most part. But here's verse 7. And verse 7 is so important. Verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. You know what I told the people today? How does a gate lift up its head? He says right here, lift up your heads, O ye gates. You know what a gate does? I've got a gate right outside my my room right here. You know what that gate is designed to do? It's designed to keep the animals on the other side of the gate. A gate is designed to let me through the gate to drive through on my property. But my duty and my responsibility is to shut that gate behind me when I go in or I go out, I shut that gate behind me. He says here in verse number 7, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. What does a gate do? A gate closes off access. A gate allows access. So he's saying right here, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. What he's actually saying is, get stuff out of your vision. If you got a gate standing in front of you, you're not going to be able, I'm not going to be able to get through my field out there if I leave that gate closed. I'm going to have to open that gate. Now, yes, I can crawl over the gate, but is it a lot easier just to go through the gate the way it's designed? to unchain it from the, from the post and open it up and walk through and close the gate back. He's saying here, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Now listen, it don't stop there. And be ye lift up ye everlasting doors. Now what is a door? Another word for a gate. How many of us closes our door to the Lord? How many closes our gate to the Lord? That's what it's telling me right here. And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. Don't let a door stand in your way. What is a door? A door of unbelief? Could it be a door 
that causes me not to care whether I am the Lord's and the fullness thereof? Could it be that I'm not really worried about where he founded the earth and where the ground came from and who is going to ascend to the hill of the Lord? The ones who stand in the holy place, the one who has clean hands, the ones who have a pure heart, the ones that don't have vanity. What is he saying? When he mentions the word gates, he's asking us to get the blockage away from us. And when he says here, lift up ye everlasting doors. Jesus even said in John chapter 10, I believe it is, I am the door. I am the door. He tells them right there in John chapter 10, I believe it is. I am the door. And he goes on to explain the value of the door. See, a door keeps things out and it also keeps things in. That's what a door does. He says here in this verse, if you move your gates and you lift up your everlasting doors listen to the end of verse 7 and the king of glory shall come in you know why the king of glory is not coming into a lot of places today because we got gates in front of people we got doors in front of people. Now, is it a natural door? I've got a door on my little room right here. I can look at it. I'm looking at it right now. That little door I'm going to go out of when in a few minutes, and I'm going to close that door back to seal off this room when I leave this room in, I don't know, three or four minutes. I'm going to leave this room. I'm going to take that door and I'm going to open that door and I'm going to walk out and I'm going to turn the light off. I'm going to close the door. It lets me out. The door seals off the protection of nothing getting in here until I come back. I don't even lock this little door out here. There ain't nobody coming in here. I just close it to keep the varmints out. What is he saying right here? And the king of glory shall come in. You know why the king of glory ain't coming in to a lot of places? There's a door that is blocking the king of glory. And if you got a door over your soul and over your salvation, then the Lord ain't going to bust the door down. He ain't going to do it. He's going to come in if you remove the, the, the door and you remove the gate from from in front of you, he'll come in, just like he says right here, and the king of glory shall come in. But let me go to verse 8. He asked a question now. David asked a question here. Who is this king of glory? If I was to ask you today, who is this king of glory? Who is the king of glory in your life? That's what I ask them folks today. Who is the king of glory in your life? It says the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Can anything overcome the Lord? Can anything we go through overcome the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing. Goliath couldn't. David told Goliath, look, I'm going to take your head off. That wasn't just chit-chat. That was the real deal. That was the real thing that was going to happen. And you know what he did? He took his head off because that stone was guided by the Holy Spirit of God. I don't think it was David's wisdom. Did David launch the stone? Yes, he did. He launched the stone. But who sent the stone to the skull? I believe that had to be a God thing. I believe that God did it. And when the stone hit the man in the head, 
David walked up, stood on him, or stood beside of him, and took the sword that Goliath had and cut his head off. And then he picked up the head to carry it back as a trophy. A big old giant head severed from the body. This is talking about who is this king of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. And then he goes and says this in verse 9. Now listen to what David does. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. He's repeating himself. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. Get them out of the way. Get things out of the way from salvation. Let salvation come in and get all the hindrances away so salvation can come in. And the king of glory shall come in. Just like it said up there in verse 7. And then he asked a question at the very end. Who is this king of glory? And the answer was the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Is the Lord your king of glory? Have you opened up your gates? Ask yourself that question. Open up the gates. Open up the, the doors of your salvation. Elderly Ministry is the website. Elderlyministry.com is the website. Elderly Ministry is the YouTube channel. If I can help you, let me know. Thank y'all for watching.